Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our third and final panel of the Inscripted series, Intersectional Stories. We're so excited to have you with us this evening. My name is Wai Jung Koo, and I am a, a light skin, mixed race, queer person um, of white settler and East Asian descent. Um, I have long, dark brown hair that's currently tied up um, sort of half up, half down in a little bun on top of my head. Um, I have tattoos on my left arm. I'm wearing a dress, a black dress with uh, sunflowers on it. Um, I have facial piercings and I'm wearing little dangly earrings. Uh, and I am sitting on a gray velvet couch. And in the background behind me on the white wall, there are um, some photos and art. And to the left of me, there is a, um, bookshelf with some records and a uh, display model of a spine. Amazing, and I'm Becky Gold. Um, I am a white woman with uh, short, dark brown hair. I have green eyes and freckles. I'm wearing a button-up short sleeve shirt uh, that has different color pastel stripes and I'm sitting in my living room in Tacaronto. Um, and so in the back you have kind of your typical living room things. There's TV and lamps and plant that's sticking out from my right side uh, and some art on the walls behind me as well. Ku and I are the co-curators of Unscripted Cultivating Languages of Access and Storytelling. When imagining what this series could be, we imagined it as an opportunity to facilitate expansive conversations about accessibility in the arts. To us, this means conversations about how we tell stories, who they reach, and the depths to which they can be understood. We recognize that, oh, go ahead. <laughs> we recognize that access is complicated and in a constant state of flux. It can evolve and devolve over time, shifting with our sociocultural landscape. Navigating and claiming access for oneself and one's community is in many ways a form of resistance. With this in mind, we wanted to hear from artists who are intentionally cultivating methods of storytelling and performance that provide wider avenues of accessibility, whether sensory based, linguistic or cultural for black, indigenous, queer, trans, deaf, mad, blind and disabled communities. We feel that the panelists and moderators included in this series exemplify what it means to take up space, to move, work, and tell stories in ways that are accessible and meaningful to them and the communities that they are a part of. This panel series would not have been possible without the support of the series co-producers, Red Dress Productions and Theatre Posmerai and funding from the Ontario Arts Council, the Toronto Arts Council, and TD Bank Group. Tonight we are thrilled to have Carmel Cachero and Anissa Mustafa providing ASL interpretation. Carmel, who is currently on the screen, is a cisgender Filipina Canadian. She has long black hair and brown eyes. She is sitting in front of a solid black background, wearing a red sweater with a black t-shirt underneath and a black scarf. Anissa, who is our second interpreter, is a light-skinned South Asian woman, and she is wearing a black headscarf and black shirt sitting against a black background. Uh, while Becky and I are the co-curators of this series, we would like to give due credit to Courage Bacchus, who conceived of and curated tonight's intersectional stories panel. Tonight's uh, conversation is one that Courage began having a few years ago with other BIPOC deaf people. And we are honored to be able to offer coordination and access support so that this conversation may reach a wider audience once more. With that, I would now like to introduce tonight's moderator, Courage Bacchus. So Natasha Cecily Bacchus is an athlete and artist, passionate about mental health, deaf advocacy, fitness, and physical expression. Throughout her life, she has nurtured passion for fitness by competing as a professional athlete and securing medal positions in both the Deaf Olympics and Pan Am Olympics, as well as many other competitive sporting events. 
While running was her first passion and a means of emotional release, she used acting as a mode of physical expression and found theater and film to be the preferred spaces to thrive as an actress. She has participated in a number of theater and film productions and has a strong desire to continue to grow and develop as an artist in these industries, expanding representation to include differently abled persons and empowering black deaf women in Canada to shine on and off the stage. Welcome, Courage. Thank you so much. Thank you, Becky and Ku. Thank you for your time. And I'm so thrilled to be here tonight. This is such an important topic, talking about language and art, and then having these panelists here looking at Black, Deaf, Indigenous, Deaf women here to, and for everyone to listen to their stories, to be aware and to gain that understanding. And it's, it's quite important to have this discussion. And it's important to listen to these voices and how they express themselves. I, I'm looking forward to this and I'm very excited to listen to what they have to say and it will impact everyone, I'm sure. Uh, so I'd like to invite our panelists, uh, Amelia, Chanel and Dominique to uh, turn on your videos and join us in the spotlight. Hello, hello everyone. Okay, so uh, Becky and I Who's are starting. Gonna... Oh yes, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Becky and I are going to turn our videos off, but Courage, I'll invite you to um, give a visual description of yourself, um, and then um, introduce and welcome our panelists. Okay, happy Friday, everyone, right? Yes, says Amelia, Janelle, and Dominique. I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Natasha Bacchus, uh, and I prefer the name Courage. And I'm wearing here a gray t-shirt with an image in the front, uh, a printed image of a dancer honoring indigenous uh, culture and indigenous land. And actually it was Dominique's uh, niece who created this. And I'll just show it to you here. It's an image of a black woman with, black, uh, sorry, an indigenous woman with black hair that's braided. Uh, and I have uh, braided hair as well. And I have a gold shell earrings on. Uh, and I am a athlete and an actor as, as well. And in the background, you can see the image here of buildings and I will pass this on to the next person. To Hello. Hello, my name is Dr. Janelle Rouse and this is my side name. It's Jane Arona Chin. I'm gonna give a visual description of myself. I'm a black deaf woman with braided lock hair up in a bun on my head. I have red framed glasses, um, a black tank top, and then a see-through polka dot shirt with a bow. And I'm on like a greenish beige plain background. So who am I? I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Well, I've had different work throughout my life, but I've worked in two different fields. The first is teaching in applied linguistics. And the second is a movement artist. So those are my two main passions. And I've been involved in many different fields in Ontario, specifically within the arts and other sort of sectors. I've been a performer and a dancer. I've been a consultant. I've been a facilitator. I've been a researcher and many more roles within the role of a writer. And so that's a little bit about who I am. Now, Amelia. Hello, my name is Amelia and my last name is Palmer. My sign name is a hand turning left on my right, uh, my, my, the right hand side of my face. I'm from Hamilton, Ontario, and I'm wearing a short green shirt. I have my black hair up in a bun. 
And my background is white, plain white background. I have glasses, purple glasses, purple frame glasses, silver earrings, silver hoop earrings rather. So again, I'm from Hamilton and I studied at Gallaudet University with a major in deaf studies and a minor in linguistics. Both of these have really impacted my life uh, because it's really important to recognize deaf history and learn more about ourselves. And specifically deaf history in Canada, we've had no exposure to growing up. And so I really wanted to empower IBPOC people here in Canada. And that's what my work has involved. Thank you, Amelia. Dominique, thank you, Courage. Hi, everyone. My name is Dominique, and this is my sign name. I'm wearing a black sweater, uh, under armor, logo in the front, long black hair, brown skin, um, and I've got turtle shell glasses. I have a piercing in my nose, uh, and behind me, you can see the door of a closet um, and some little red things in the top there. Uh, a little bit about my background. I'm a university student, um, and uh, I haven't decided on my major yet, but I identify, sorry, is it freezing for you? I'm Oneida, I identify as Oneida, and I'm learning uh, linguistics as well, and learning, sorry, a lot about my own language, the Oneida, Oneida language. And I really enjoy learning about other cultures as well. I'm an artist and I do wood burning um, as my main field of practice. And that's a little bit about me. Thank you, Dominique. And just to add uh, my background, you can see uh, it, Toronto and the CN Tower behind me, right behind my head. All right, thank you for that. I'm gonna ask a few questions um, and I want to know your perspective, uh, ASL and BASL and Oneida Sign Language, OSL. So BASL is Black American Sign Language. I uh, just wanted to know your, your thoughts and views on that question. Janelle speaking, I can go first. Okay, well, my perspective is that obviously American Sign Language is the sign language that is used here. Um, obviously in Canada, we also do have LSQ, Langue de Signe Québécois, which is the sign language used in Quebec. And most people obviously know of ASL, but Black American Sign Language, many people haven't known about it until recently. And specifically within Canada, many deaf Black people have been started talking about it. And it's become really popular over the last few months. BASL doesn't really have a lot. I'd have no answer as to like what it is because there hasn't been a lot of research on it in Canada compared to America. America has a lot of research on BASL. There's a, a lot of research there and a lot of recognition in the States, but Canada, not so much. And so that's my perspective on it here. Thank you for sharing. Amelia, did you have something to add? Yeah, so my perspective is obviously, Amer as Janelle said, uh, American Sign Language is a standard, ASL. Um, and I didn't know a lot about BASL until I went to Gallaudet University and I was shocked to learn that there's such a variety. Uh, there's in Texas and Oklahoma, Tennessee, and so on. So many of the states, especially in the South, have their forms of BASL, which I felt so connected to because we don't really have that in Canada. We don't really have that deaf Black community and their specific language here in Canada. Um, I'm from Jamaica and we have Jamaican Sign Language, which I've certain, uh, uh, just been learning, Patois, um, but I had no exposure until BASL until, until I went to Gallaudet University. I know a lot of people thought that BASL is a recent uh, thing, but it's been here for a long time. It's only recently been recognized by the greater population. So that's a problem because it's been around for so many years, but that recognition and that exposure has only recently started to happen. Myself and Janelle have, start, have been talking about it for a while and we have our own culture and we have our own language as black deaf women. It's, it's there. 
we, people just need to be exposed to it. That awareness needs to be raised for both non-deaf people and for the deaf community as well. Patois, can you explain that? What was that again? So Patois. Yes. So Patois is the language in Jamaica that they speak. My family speaks Patois. Uh, another word for it is Jamaican Creole, which is like uh, West African languages, a language mixed with the English and the indigenous language. And it, it mixed until it became its own language. It has its own culture and everything there. So excuse the interpreter. The interpreter earlier said it was the sign language in Jamaica, but that's incorrect. And so um, there hasn't, uh, a lot of deaf people here haven't really learned uh, about uh, Patois, as well as Jamaican Sign Language. Uh, that's something that I started to learn later in my life. Thank you, Amelia. I had, uh, didn't know about that word. Um, so Oneida Sign Language, Dominique, did you want to speak to that? Um, and you can also add to what, uh, about BASL, if you'd like as well. So I, ASL is a language that I've used my whole life and had exposure to that and the culture and the community and everything's there. But OSL, Oneida Sign Language, uh, the reason we have that, we identi it identifies with who we are and relates to part of our language as well. It relates to my identity deeply in the Oneida community and my people in my home. And it's how we communicate with each other. And it allows us to have that connection with the community, with our language and our heritage. Is it? In our way of expressing ourselves. And this has to do with our, our ancestors, our Anishinaabe ancestors and the experience that they've brought in down through the, through the generations. We want to pass on that history that we have and our language. And it's empowering as well to have that, that language that we call our own in our community. We recognize both ASL and OSL, but we honor the OSL and we're proud of that. That's a great perspective and thank you for sharing that. So BASL, so you've been studying that, looking at linguistics, or this can have to do with Oneida Sign Language. So the development of these languages, uh, does anyone have any answer to that question? Amelia speaking, I can go ahead. Well, when I first moved to Ontario and then later on went to Gallaudet University, I met a variety of Black deaf people there. And I saw their different versions uh, of how they express themselves, but I felt like I was limited in how I could express myself. One day I was in a classroom and someone in the class asked me, well, no offense, but I understand I, I, what do you mean by when you say you understand certain people better? Sorry, Carmel, did I get that correctly? You can ask for clarification. I okay, didn't. I'm just going to clarify that. So clarify. Sorry, sorry, I'm just going to clarify that. Do you mind again? The interpreter is just asking to go again. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so someone said, no offense, but I notice that deaf black people sign differently than other people. And I re that really impacted me because I realized that they were using black ASL. And I said, oh, should I be using black ASL too as a black person? But then when I use that, use black ASL, does that impact how I'm understood by other people? When I was hanging around with black deaf people, I felt like we understood each other. And when I was hanging around with non-black deaf people of non-black people who were deaf, I, I would code switch. And so I found myself code switching and changing how I expressed myself in ASL compared to black ASL. 
but I realized that many of us don't recognize Black ASL as a language, but it is, in fact, its own language. And just because you don't understand it doesn't mean that it isn't a language. And so that really impacted me when I learned about code switching and really translating between a language. I, I felt like so much of my uh, learning was parallel with me understanding with what Patois was. And I really felt like, uh, you know, that was something that needed, I needed more exposure about. So that really impacted me. Yes, Janelle. So Janelle speaking. So I, I know that many people have said, well, the ASL is not a language. And I'm wondering where does that decision come from? I was involved in a panel um, a while ago at Gallaudet University. It was a very popular panel. I was like, oh my gosh, there's so many great people here. Who am I to be on this panel? Oh my goodness. Anyways, so on, on that panel, we were talking about this term. It's best described as Racial linguistics, right, says Amelia. So if you look at the word racial, it means to do with someone's skin color or maybe someone's background as indigenous or, or Asian or so on. And the linguistics is how that person's language uh, affects how people respond to them. And some people can hear how someone or see how someone speaks or signs and that will impact what they think of them. And where is that coming from? That's coming from history, the history of linguistics and who decides what is better than others. And Dominique, I've, obviously as an indigenous person that has been very much there in your history. People tend to miss that whitewashing of language that happens over time and don't realize that language has its own history and has its own transformation. And on my end, I'm, I'm fascinated by linguistics. Anything new that comes up or whether I've not seen before, I am like, wow, that's incredible. I wanna learn more about that. Tell me more about that, please share. And people will be like, oh, why are you so excited? And, and that's just who I am. I am extremely passionate about linguistics. And people say, what, you're interested in my language? I'm like, yes, teach me, teach me. And they teach me. Sometimes they think I'm a little over eager. But I really want to learn more about language. And me wanting to learn more about others people, other people's language can often help their self-esteem as well. Amelia. I want to add, I want to add, says Amelia, people, immigrants who have moved, especially from the islands and have moved maybe to like North America have to learn a new type of ASL. And that ASL, so I have to learn ASL or whatever language there is, whatever sign language is in their dominant country and that language becomes dominant and it almost colonizes them because they tend to, they might forget their, uh, their traditions and their history of where they moved from. And so that is a form of linguistic colonization. Dominique, what is your perspective looking at Oneida sign language versus ASL? Um, Sorry, it's freezing on my end. Would you like me to repeat it? Yes, please. Yeah, I remember, I know you love languages, right? Dominique? Yes. And I'm just curious, you know, you, you see ASL and Oneida. How, what impact has that had on you comparing the two and your experiences? Are you good? I'm just reading the, the captions. Okay, I've caught up now. So Oneida Sign Language versus ASL. You know, before I would communicate and do my day-to-day -day with ASL, and, you know, most of the reason was because of schooling. Uh, you know, I, that's how I would access information. So I was strong with ASL and communicating that way. And then I started to focus more on my own community and how people would use their own language, the, the Oneida spoken language. And they recommended that I would go to school to learn about the language, learn about the land and land recognition. And so my first experience was taking a course. I really wanted to really understand the language. I was quite interested in that. 
And so I joined a group learning about the Mohawk language. And it just had a huge impact on me, listening to the, that perspective. You know, as an ASL user, you know, of course it's important to communicate, uh, you know, and having that language and to understand that language. But I felt that a part of me was missing. So I decided to have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, tutor. And I worked with that person every day, uh, took the course and, and just the, the thinking and the logic of English was something that I had to let go of in my brain in order to really immerse myself in the language. I know that ASL is heavily influenced by English as well. So I had to let that go. So they provided me with different tools to understand the indigenous languages. And it was quite meaningful and learning about all the meaning of the language and the words. It was quite overwhelming learning all this. But I felt that it gave me such a better perspective and the big picture on my community and who I am. I know that ASL provides that in a certain way, but looking at Oneida Sign Language and Indigenous languages, just how I would process that information. And it's just so different from English and it just had a huge impact on me and it had got me thinking. One thing that was quite important that I felt stuck with me all this time, like thinking about ASL and communicating, you know, that's a day-to-day -day communication, but with Oneida Sign Language and learning that and learning about the language and communicating, there is significance to that, uh, respect for the land and the animals and, and earth, mother earth, and our relationship with Turtle Island. In my language, we are able to express ourselves in that way and I could be myself and who I am with, with my community. So having that connection with nature, with land, with the animals, and learning that through my own language, and it has a different meaning. Uh, even comparing words on how we identify gender with individuals. I learned so much. It's, it, it's expressed in a different way within Oneida Sign Language. So it, that had a huge impact on me. You're just saying, oh, wow, that's, that's incredible. Uh, Dominique, I missed one of the things that you said, you finger spelled M something, M. There was one word, you're talking about Mohawk, an instructor. Mohawk, learning the language. Once I was done that, it gave me a better understanding and it gave me a better understanding of the bigger picture of where I am in this in this world. And I relate that to the Oneida Sign Language as well. They're different languages, but they're quite similar, uh, but their accents are different. And, you know, Oneida versus Mohawk, they can find similarities within the languages, but there are also specific tendencies to each. We can understand what the other person's saying. The meaning is quite similar and communicate with each other. And it's quite interesting. When we have uh, huge gatherings with the two different languages, there isn't a lot of misunderstanding and a, a lot of conflict in that way because we can understand each other easily. And I'm just so fascinated with learning the language and really being around that, communicate, that, that community and communicating with each other. For Oneida Sign Language, in the spoken language, we, we learn about the meaning and how we can translate that to Oneida Sign Language. And that's the discussion that we have with each other, how we can have that common understanding and, and know the deeper meaning for, the, for those terminology, the signs and the spoken language that are used. Great. So Mohawk, so that's the sign for Mohawk, right? And then we have OSL, Oneida Sign Language, and you're able to communicate. It's a different language, but you're still able to make that connection and understand each other. And Dominic King, yeah. sorry, it's a little frozen. Sorry, I'm just gonna pop my screen open. Oh, hi there. Uh, 
Yes. Yes. Hi. Don't mean to interrupt this wonderful conversation, but we did mention a break at 740 and I was just checking in to see if the panelists would like to take that. Yeah, let's uh, five minutes uh, in five minutes. So I just want to clarify with Dominic the last point and then we'll take the break right um, after they're done. Great. Amazing. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank um, so you that'll be a 10 minute break. Um, once this uh, next point is made. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, so back to Dominique. Um, I just want to clarify. Your, your video is freezing just a little bit. So just with Mohawk language, and we have Oneida sign language, you said that there are, there's a common understanding between the two groups, right? That's what you had said. I just want to make sure that I caught that. Yes, that's right. You got it. That's what I said. Great. So we'll, we'll take a break for 10 minutes and, uh, and then I will share more of my thoughts. So go ahead and get a drink, uh, relieve yourself, buy a break and we'll see everyone in 10 minutes. Thank you so Sounds much. Good. Sounds good.
your pr different perspectives are so interesting. It's got me thinking so much. A lot to think about. Really cool. Okay, sorry. I'm excited to ask uh, more questions. So I'm sure the three of you have been fascinated with the language all this time, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are when you think about language, linguistics, and art. How has it influenced uh, your practice? Who wants to go first? Chanel speaking, I can go first. Well, yeah, it's a definitely a difficult question because for whom, you know, for whom has it influenced? For whom has it not influenced? I think it's influenced everyone. If I've had to pick one, I mean, it's a really hard answer. But based on my experience, my childhood, growing up, seeing what worked and what I guess hasn't worked in my life. Well, you have to understand my family are all hearing people. I'm the only deaf person. I'm the only one who uses sign language in my family. And so I've had to communicate through creativity, maybe through art, through using photos, writing back and forth, so on and so forth, really I was able to express myself using all of those different forms of communication. And so that's really become who I am as a movement artist. I've started using movement to communicate because it's all been right there in my upbringing. So yeah, I mean, of course it's influenced me. Wow. Maybe someone else can add. I have so much to say. Amelia? Oh, Dominique, go ahead. Sure. Um, well, there's just, it's not just one person. When I think about the community of, of people, my community, and who has inspired me, uh, you know, looking at creativity, and it's just had such a huge impact on me, um, beading and jewelry making and drawing. And I've been involved in experiencing all that and exp exposure to the culture. You know, you look at everything in, in the art world and my art practice. Uh, I know with jewelry, uh, you know, making those areas, that's something that I'm quite fascinated with and how I express myself. Amelia? Amelia speaking. I mean, my family has also influenced linguistics in terms of how I've expressed myself. When we were talking about racial linguistics and, and everything. I've been extremely fascinated by that. Poetry as well, Black American Sign Language and BASL poetry. So for example, I, I had written our an ASL poetry from my uh, grandfather's funeral and my sign related to um, his background and it really influenced the hearing audience as well because it was more of a, of a performance. And so I don't think anyone can say they have not been influenced by language, it's impossible. And everyone enjoys uh, art and mixing that with language. And of course, it's, it's highly connected. Of course it is. Of course, it's saying, Janelle yes. and Amelia, yeah. <laughs> Janelle speaking. So my degree was in applied linguistics. Well, again, I love that sign, applied linguistics. You see how I've signed it? That's so cool. Anyways, so I'm an educator. And I've always been looking at various issues that have come up in the world and how language is involved in perhaps solving those issues and how art is also involved. And again, there's no right or wrong answer in any of this. It's all creativity. If you try and you try to see the issue, see what happens, try to solve it. So you take something and then you apply something to it. And so I love that. So you can see how much I'm smiling right now. I'm definitely a linguistics nerd. Um, if any of you has, haven't studied linguistics, I highly encourage you to do so. I just want to add to, you know, in terms of linguistics, I, I did, you know, I was curious about it. I wanted to see what it was all about. Um, you know, at, sorry, did you catch that? No, you have to. At uh, at Western um, and the academics, sorry, I had to clarify that. So really, there is no right or wrong, like Janelle had said. It's just being able to express ourselves and how to explain language. I know that that's what linguistics is all about, but 
if you start to label it right or wrong, then it leads to language discrimination. If people start to build those opinions based on those right or wrong, quote unquote, right or wrong opinions and thoughts. Yeah, Amelia. So that is, sorry, I'm going to clarify that word. Oh, linguistic, sorry, linguistic. Linguist oppression. Okay, yeah. Linguisticism. Linguisticism is a form of yeah. linguistic oppression. Um, where just because you don't understand the language, you've already judged that language as lower than yourself or that person is less intelligent. But that that's your lack of understanding. That's the issue. And at the same time, you know, it causes that oppression because, you know, you, you start to see the dominant uh, language and that starts to have authority over what people do. And Janelle said, that's where we go back to art. In art, there is no judgment. Whether someone's dancing or performing or any of that, you just look at it. Maybe you don't understand what's going on. There's no interpreters in art. You just have to observe the th what is happening and, and, and be influenced by it. All of these things, linguistics and art are inextric inextricably meshed together. And it just, all of this has really influenced me and so much of us so much. Okay, so let me pose a question. Emotions, influence. See, everything that's happening on my face is a form of communication. So I can't let go of language and say, okay, I'm gonna just do art. I'm just going to do language. It's impossible. They are each other. What about you guys? And I, I forgot to think, uh, answer your question, like art and language, yes, very much connected. You know, when you think about singing and music or dance, and it has its own form of expression, but it's a form of language as well. You know, everything is, it it's a, comes full circle. You can't separate the two, like Janelle had said. Amelia, did you have something to add to that? <laughs> this is such a hot discussion. I love it. Well, exactly what Dominique just said. So my art, my poetry, my sign language poetry is trying to get hearing people to understand. Sorry, trying to get hearing people to understand my poetry is tough because it's not their language. But what they do is they look at my emotions. They look at what's reflected on my face, my eyebrows, my, my, my facial expressions and so on. And that has a whole language behind it that translates into their understanding whether or not they understand the specific signs I'm using. And also to add to that, you know, I realized that art is, you know, it, it really, it grabs you. It's, it's, you know, sometimes there's something you've never seen before and there's just something about it. Uh, that it has a deeper meaning that sometimes it can be communicated in so many different ways. You know, sometimes it's something, it's great to see things that you've never seen before. You don't want everything to be the same, it'd be boring, right? Exactly. And I agree with you completely, you know, as an artist myself, the way I express myself, it's, it's a challenge, but, you know, expression through dance, through facial expression, through movement, it's there. And it's just an amazing way to, to get your emotions out there and communicate that. And, you know, I, I have to do it. It's just, it's so great. Any, anything to add to that last question? Are we happy with our answers? We're good. Okay. So the next question, I want to get your honest opinion. When we think about colonization and decolonization and the influence that that has had on language, whether it be ASL, BASL, or an Ida Sign Language. So what do you think those ideas, colonization, decolonization, the influence on language? You two go ahead. Go. You you go. Know, okay, okay, we're we'll all go. looking at each other like, who wants to go first? <laughs> okay, Janelle, I'll go, says Janelle, I'll go first. Well, just before the break, we were talking about rach, racial linguistics, remember? And so Dr. Jonathan Rue, I believe the interpreter got that, is an American uh, scholar, and they've come here to Canada, and I, and I followed so much of their work, and they um, have been talking about uh, Spanish, uh, about Spanish, and, um, and I think that a lot of their studies can be applied to Oneida Sign Language, ASL, and so on, even if it isn't specifically about sign language. Uh, he got me thinking about decolonizing language. 
he has that term there. That term, I think I'm going to write it down or let me just check. It's, it's such an interesting term. Oh, yeah. They're amazing. It's amazing. I love it. It is called... <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to spell it. Give me one sec. It's called... Okay, hold on. The interpreter needs to... I have to clarify that word. Sorry, do you mind? Clarify that word. It's <laughs> <laughs> such a fancy word. It's such a big word. Okay, let's do it again. So it's called... Oh, racial um, racial colonial phenomena, phenomena. racial colonial phenomena perfect <laughs> right that word that's, that's oh a new goodness. word for me you're just saying yeah <laughs> i think we got so it that term relates to a situation that we're in what language is being used and then just as Amelia talked about, there's ASL and there's Black American Sign Language. And, so, and an individual who can use both has to then code switch when they are going from one language to another. And that can influence someone's thoughts as to whether they're co colonized or not. I agree, says Amelia. That mm -hmm. code switching can That's be a so form true. of colonizing and decolonizing. I'd never thought about that before. And when you're talking to someone uh, who's using Black American Sign Language, if you throw away the idea of code switching and try to use both, is that even possible? So uh, decolonizing my own language starts with myself and starts with where I am or what, how I'm using a language and in what format. And how someone might respond to me and how we respond to each other. And that interaction begins with thinking about how to decolonize that interaction. So that phenomenon is very interesting. So Amelia is saying, I think linguistic attitude or language attitude is also very important, language-based attitude. Many people have attitude toward language. If I don't understand it, I don't wanna learn it. And that's a form of colonization. If you don't understand my language, I'm gonna force you to use uh, ASL or, or the dominant language all the way. And you can see how that's develop, have impacted the development of children and adults who've had that forced upon them. My own culture begins to become eradicated and I have to then follow what the dominant culture is and just accept what's going on because my, my language, which might be the minority language isn't accepted. And that's a form of colonization. Like BASL, it impacted me because I thought when I was younger and I was using it, uh, you know, people who use BSA, children who use BASL might be mocked. Black people might be looked down upon. And I say, no, black people have to preserve that language and make, you know, the dominant, make the majority learn about that language in order for it to be respected and preserved. If I'm going to learn your language, you have to learn my language too, and it'll become that reciprocity form of teaching. I'm going to add, says Janelle, be careful. I mean, it's great. We have so much to talk about. Um, yes, we're going to make, quote unquote, people learn, such as when we're talking about Oneida Sign Language and Black ASL. But does that mean... Um, their interpreters just clarify it. Um... Carmel, did you catch that? If you're, if you're not Oneida or Black, is it something that you could start to learn? You know, it, that would be a form of cultural appropriation if you just start to take it upon yourself to use those languages for yourself. Right, says Amelia. And that's a form of privilege when you can start learning someone else's language, even if it isn't your own. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Maybe you might think a form of a language like Oneida Sign Language or BASL is very cool, but be careful. If you want to learn it, you have to support the people whose language it is, who have grown up using that language and who are from that culture. Support them and, and, and ask for them. Don't, don't start doing things on your own uh, ignorantly. You know, don't say I can do it without them. That's a form of privilege. I agree. I agree. Amelia agrees 100%. I just want to add too, 
uh, to what Amelia had commented on before. You know, keeping BAS BASL, keeping it true to yourself. For Indigenous folks and learning the language, we value that language and the land and the history that comes along with the Canadian government and the governments that have taken that colonial power. You know, there's just so much history there, traumatizing history. And that idea of colonialism in adjusting to that majority population and those in power, you know, we feel that we have to switch and accommodate the majority. You know, people have to really look inward and recognize the importance of keeping their own language and make those take those steps to learn that. And it's important to do that. It's it's hard to get through it, and but and it's not something that comes quickly or automatically. You have to expose yourself every day and learning those those languages. And depending on where you are uh, and who the who the people you are around, who surround you, and that's really important. So I agree with you completely about valuing that and keeping that keeping your own language. Dominique, uh, sorry, Amelia speaking. Um, so 100% ASL has been influenced by the dominant, by the English as well, by the dominant language. And uh, similarly with Oneida people, Oneida sign language and Oneida languages have not been recognized as well. And uh, we, an American sign language has also borrowed from Aboriginal sign languages. Black American Sign Language and ASL have also influenced each other. And so there's a history behind how each language develops. And that decolonizing your learning starts with, you know, who's teaching. You know, when we look back in history uh, of the Indigenous peoples and their land, you think about, you know, the white settlers who have come to this land and they arrived and, you know, how did they communicate? You know, people had different languages, and so they basically were colonized, and they had to they they tried to get rid of the indigenous languages. But indigenous peoples recognize that it's important to still be aware of that, and it's part of who we are. And there's no shame in that, and to remember that that's part of who you are. You know, when we think about history and the colonizers coming in and the treaties and how they communicated. Basically, they were disregarded. The indigenous peoples were disregarded and English became more of a dominant language. And it has had a long lasting effect over the years. Those are coming to the Americas. And if they brought their own sign languages, You know, when we think about language colonization, and it just had a huge and long lasting impact on the Indigenous peoples and the Indigenous languages. Dr. Uh, Janelle speaking, and yeah, American Sign Language, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Indigenous Sign Language is something that's uh, also, sorry, I'm going to clarify, Janelle, you said which sign language? Which? Oh, Latin. Latin. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, excuse the interpreter. Latin is a language that's now dead. Sorry for the interpreter. And I, I see what you're, you're oh, the discussion here about code switching and changing languages. Do you think it, you know, makes sense about translating to ASL, BASL, or Oneida Sign Language? You know, I feel like it's frustrating, but, you know, what are the pros and cons about translating between the two languages? You code switch, you try to accommodate the, the people that you're communicating with, but I'm just curious about your thoughts. Is it possible to translate between the languages? Dominique, go ahead, says Amelia. <sighs> so of course, like I mentioned, I use ASL my whole life and you know, I, I change languages when I'm at home or I run my community. Uh, you know, I'm in different places all the time. I'm in work, school and home and use different languages accordingly. 
you know, I do have to change the language that I use. Um, you know, when I think of the ASL community and where I use to communicate that, but sometimes they're misunderstandings. And then I have to explain certain concepts and ideas. And then in my community, I, I feel that I can communicate using Oneida Sign Language, but, you know, it's not a bad thing. I mean, there are pros and cons to translating between the two and, and conveying the meaning between the two languages. Yeah, says Amelia, it's called a contact language. Contact languages happen everywhere in the world. And if you look at business, for example, um, if someone goes to China and uh, someone within China, uh, someone so goes to a, a couple of things from the fridge. Another, sorry, um, someone goes to another country and they have to change how they speak um, depending on the language or the situation, um, also the environment and so on. Um, so I see code switching as a positive thing that help la languages broaden and develop further. For example, in jobs, if you want to, you know, if you want to get more money, sometimes you have to code switch in order to uh, have a more formalized lexicon. Uh, whereas at home, when we're talking, we're just, we're more, we're casual and, and that can often sometimes be criticized within the workplace. So again, there are positives and negatives to the whole idea of contact language and uh, code switching. Janelle, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, what Amelia and Dominique said, I completely agree uh, with your perspective. I've had the same experiences as well. So there's, you know, flip sides of the coin. You know, we can't just take, there's language on one side of the coin and then there's positives and negatives on both sides. If you have the coin, you gotta take it. You know, you can't just flip the coin and, and choose one half. There's no straight answer to this. And just to add to that, you know, about switching languages and I can see that happening, you know, as BIPOC individuals, uh, we are more accustomed to it and and managing that switching between groups and languages. You know, I, I think that we, we have that skill above others because we're just so used to doing that our whole lives. And that, says Amelia, is called being bilingual or multilingual. Exactly, yeah. That's who we are. We have those skills. People don't recognize that ability to, to use multi-languages in all of our interactions. We have so many positives and, and, and privileges as multilingual people. And non-deaf people don't recognize that. We have that skill as deaf individuals to be able to code switch within so many different languages. There's the deaf languages that we can use. There's also forms of communication with hearing people like writing. You know, that's already two or three languages right there. I agree with you completely. Dominique, did you want to say something? Did you want to add? No, I'm, I'm good. Okay, great. My next question. So why doesn't everyone just use the same visual language? You know, uh, there are different sign languages, but why can't we just all pick one? <laughs> Janelle speaking, well, uh, we can't use one language overnight. We can't just throw everything away and, and, and use one language overnight. That's impossible. You can't even do that with spoken languages. That requires decades and decades of immersion and socialization and, and, and language and, and learning and teaching. Maybe within one year, someone can uh, learn a language and if they don't use it, that language disappears, right? So in, oh, sorry, just for the interpreter, we're just clarifying. Okay, so if someone, for example, learns a language and then they don't use it, that language might still be like lurking in the back of their head, but it's, I don't, still don't know how to use it. So for example, as a girl, I grew up learning one language, but I like French or something, but if I don't use it growing up, I'm not gonna have it in my working memory. And does that mean that as uh, that I can learn sign languages overnight to communicate with the entire world? Absolutely not. Amelia speaking, it also depends on your environment, you know? I mean, it's, it's a tough because when, as, as a visual language user, you have to have visual access to other people. Spoken language users can like hear people, but visual language users need to see people. And there's also been that discussion of whether sign languages have been a language or not. There's also forms of like signed exact English, 
which is might not be a re considered a real language, but it's a, a way of teaching English literacy using sign language. Um, and so really explaining, we need to educate people onto what it, what it means to be a sign language user. And, and maybe, and people can say that, you know, uh, and so I've also noticed that young children pick up visual language so much faster than auditory language because of uh, their acquisition styles. And it takes a certain number of years to become fluent in a language, I mean, six or seven years, some people say. And so that's why it's hard to say, like, like Dr. Rouse had said, overnight, someone just can't learn one common visual language and the entire world can communicate with it. That takes seven years to become fluent in a language. That's an incredibly long time, you know? So that's a criteria. Dominique, did you want to add to that? Well, yeah, learning for, well, it depends, you know, on, on the age of the person, but also who you're around. If you're around family, if you're exposed to it, if you're exposed to two different languages, you know, if you're born into that, then you're, it's so much easier to acquire that language if you see it every day. You know, other people take a language in course in university, perhaps, and they decide to take another language at the university level, but they're not born into it. And so it doesn't come naturally to them very quickly, you know, but if you're born into a family that speaks multiple languages, then you've already established that exposure and you grew up with it. And it's all about socializing and exposing yourselves. Thanks for that answer. Did anyone have anything to add? Yes, Janelle speaking. <laughs> Janelle, yes. Thing. I have a little, it's, well, I have a little bit of a challenge because recently, so I, I was taking, I was in a webinar and I was using American Sign Language. And I was thinking about the people who are deafblind. And when we talk about visual language, I mean, deafblind people use tactile language or, or movement. Deaf, sorry, deafblind people use tactile ASL or sign language. So the word visual, I'm challenging you guys on that usage of that term. And so maybe this can be a sign. Carmel, do you know how to translate that? No. no okay. And Amelia adding, <clears throat> in ASL or to black, uh, sorry, to deaf blind people, you have to often describe how people look. You have to also describe the location, the face, who you're signing to and so on. And so there's different um, uh, approaches within tactile and deaf blind people's usage of ASL that are different from deaf people's usage. And also to add Dominique saying for deaf blind folks, you know, you have to talk about location and where where everything is located to that person and you use your hands to describe that tactily you know how it relates it relates to the body so language is communicating through the body and it's able they're able to understand that absolutely you have to explain says janelle and you have to touch says amelia janelle saying I mean, is visual, ASL really visual if we're not using, we're not including the deafblind community? That's not inclusive. So true. Thank you, Janelle, for bringing that up. You got me. Yeah, visual language. So that sign is a way to describe the tactile language of ASL. Janelle saying, does this making sense for the audience? Audience? If there's any deafblind folks in the audience too? Think about that. Yeah, this. I agree That's with right. you. Yeah, I guarantee. Yeah, definitely. It's food for thought for everyone here. Yeah, we're just reading the comments. Yeah, hold on one sec. So we have 822 now. Um, maybe we should go to the Q&A. Or do I? Well, that sign that we just used, uh, it's, a, it's a sign for tactile ASL for deafblind people. I'm just learning a little bit about that. So I think that's correct. So deafblind people have their own language structure. 
um, and that they're fighting to recognize. It's under the umbrella of ASL, but it's specifically for deafblind people. Thank you for clarifying that, Amelia. We have one question from Lindsay Dunn and asks, Black deaf people have colonized language by Black hearing people. For example, so post-colonial Africa, now we have Black deaf people. Have they been colonized with by ASL or LSQ? Do you see that? as a, sorry, I'm just gonna scroll down here. Amelia is saying, I don't see the question. Can we post the question somewhere? Do you see that added oblig responsibility? So how do we decolonize that and should we accept that though that that has happened. Amelia's asking, do you mind uh, uh, restating that question? Okay, so this is from Lindsay Dunn. So black deaf people use co co the colonizers language. Even if we think of post-colonial Africa, Nowadays, we have Black deaf people who have to add the colonial co colonizer sign language like ASL LSQ. Do you find that it's an added responsibility to Black deaf folks to go through that process of decolonizing that? Or is it something that we need to just accept as it is? That's a hard question, right? <laughs> yes, says Janelle. Okay, I'm thinking, let me think what I'm gonna say. My brain's just catching up. Okay, so we have American Sign Language and we have long seen Quebecois here in Canada. And I, and I talked about how Creole, for example, has uh, uh, been influenced in Jamaica and how it's been colonized. But, okay, I'm just gonna, uh, Carmel, did you get that? Mm -mm. Okay, just clarifying. Okay, so languages have influenced each other, each other's languages. So for example, as someone moves to one country, as people move, to, as countries shift and populations change. Sorry. Okay, yeah. So things, as, and languages become locked in or static is another word, no change. And so that's not necessarily, that doesn't happen within language. Uh, so the interpreter, sorry, just to clarify for the interpreter, languages are not static. Languages don't become locked in. So what's an, uh, what's a, how do I explain this better? So for example, the sign for family used an F and now it's become a wide-handed sign. The sign for culture used a C and now that sign has changed. So in American Sign Language, we have language shift and change. And language has evolved. With each generation has a new new type of ASL that they're using. They're influencing each other and immigration and so on is also influencing language. And is that colonization? I don't, I don't know if I would say that. Language is not static, language evolves. So to answer that question, I mean, it's a complicated question, I accept that responsibility because, well, when we're talking about Canada's Black American Sign Language, what evidence, what research do we have about it here? Only 20, 30 years later, are people 
uh, uh, Black deaf seniors' languages being recognized when they're seniors. Whereas in America, there's now exposure and more research for Black deaf youth's language, BASL, happening. There are BA, I mean, I don't think there are BASL courses that I know of. Amelia is saying, well, there's talk of some BASL courses being offered. People are now talking about how they want BASL expo exposure and more courses being offered. And so that there's a there's discussion happening. They're trying to develop courses in the States in order to develop more awareness and preservation of that language. And I remember I wanted to learn about BASL because it also applies to where I am now. Black people in Canada are from Africa or from the islands have languages that have been erased or forgotten due to ASL taking over or LSQ taking over. And so we need more records and more, uh, you know, discussion about uh, discussions about that language happening as languages start to evolve language previous versions of language can also disappear so it can be a burden a little bit but it's also a responsibility it's tough um <clears throat> Canadian history in terms of French and English and 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 the the conflict that's happening between the two languages uh you know we use both languages and some languages uh, and English has become the dominant majority or in some provinces French is the dominant um, and then the other language becomes oppressed and those people are fighting back who are being oppressed. And, and so their first language becomes like a second language and so on and so forth. That process technically can be a form of colonization and ASL and LSQ can follow those processes too. Maybe with Oneida sign language as well. So that, I mean, it's tough. It's tough to decolonize whatever situation you're in. It's definitely tough. Dominic, did you want to add to that? Uh, no, I don't have anything to say to that. Okay, let's go back to the viewers. If there are any questions. Leah Riddell is asking, So do you always have to code switch when you're, okay. Can, okay, so Leah asked a question. Do you have to change your language, code switch with white people? Can you, you know, so if you feel comfortable with the person, do you feel that you still have to or not? Or can you just be yourself? Well, says Amelia. You have to understand black ASL is extremely expressive. We use so much space. Whereas ASL is, is more, is, is, it has a more, is more sedate, I would say, maybe a bit more moderate. And so people who are not black might think maybe I'm angry. Maybe I'm being too dramatic. I'm like, no, no, that's who I am. That's my culture. But if you're not used to what that looks like, if you're used to more of a sedate version of a language like ASL, well, if I don't code switch when I'm talking to you, you might, there might be misunderstandings that occur. I mean, yeah, it, it's a tough, it's a tough conundrum. Also, too, you know, suppose you don't change, and you know white folks will end up criticizing us because their expectations and what they they predict what we will say and how we'll communicate you know it, it, it can be a form of discrimination you know and it can they think that you know they don't really appreciate it in the same way and so we just kind of avoid those situations really janelle saying well when i'm working after work, I can really be myself. But when I'm during when, during work, when I'm on the clock and I can't be myself, and if I, or if I'm not tired, okay, so if I'm too tired to explain what I mean, I have to, it, it can become a really big misunderstanding like in the workplace or with non-Black ASL users. So I have to kind of almost police myself uh, and my tone. And I can only really be who I am, be, be, who, be comfortable with myself in certain situations. 
Amelia's adding. Tone, uh, we code switch to avoid microaggressions. Sometimes if people will make comments that really take me aback, that offend me in very in maybe very small ways, but overall make a very big impact on who I am. And so I code switch to just to avoid those uh, small offenses. Maybe courage, like courage when you do that snapping thing to agree with something, that snapping or and that facial attitude that you add, if you don't see that within the general ASL community who are not <laughs> no. black, we, we do that as black people, black deaf people. And people, or when we say, girl, please, or, or you know, include that kind of attitude and that culture within our uh, as sign language, that's code switching for the black deaf community. Or Janelle, Courage, Dominique, maybe you understand what I mean, but other people who are looking may see this as a negative, my perspective as being negative, which it isn't. It is what it is, right? If anything to add to that question? No, go to the next one. Lindsay asked another question. There are more indigenous communities reclaiming their language. When we think about uh, Latin America and Africa, Caribbean sign languages, you know, we see those communities um, identifying that a lot of the languages have been stolen or colonized around the world. So black deaf, in the black deaf diaspora from Africa, does that, what would it mean if you were to, you radical against that idea and theory? So hold on, let me just. One second, I need to take some notes says Chanel. Amelia, do you want to go ahead? Everyone's everyone's thinking. Sorry, I'm I'm just going to reread. I found the question. I'm just going to reread that uh, the interpreter. I'm going to I'm going to read the question that Lindsay had typed. Uh, the reason for the question is there is there is a growing movement among indigenous people around the world to reclaim their native languages. And the same is true for African and Latin American Caribbean sign languages as well. I see that as part of a global movement to reclaim identities stolen by mass colonization and slavery around the world. Where would black deaf diaspora Africans fit in such a movement and what would be its purpose in liberation theory? And I apologize for that from the interpreter. <laughs> Okay, who wants to go first asks Courage. Janelle, Janelle, uh, you go first, please. <laughs> because I know Amelia has so much to say about this. Go ahead. I'm learning, says Amelia. I'm learning from you, Janelle. And that's, I mean, that's important. So that word liberation, I'm really taking a think about this freedom and rebellion and everything that liberation entails. Rec people are really starting to uh, uh, be more aware about these issues now. You know, we might not necessarily have been quiet, but we've been more, I guess, oppressed, repressed rather. And now enough is enough. We're making some noise. And people are like, whoa, 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 whoa. They're, everyone's being so loud about this. But now is the time to, for people to learn from each other. Compared to before. I mean, there was people were already talking about these issues for a long time, for years and years and years. For example, Oneida language, there's been a resurgency in, in that recognition and, and growing of that language, but people haven't been realized. And then recently, in the last few years, people have started seeing those movements and, and for BASL as well. 
really well, it's only really come into a growing awareness in Canada here, it, it, but it hasn't been a recent phenomenon. It's been happening for a time. So in terms of the idea of liberation, we've got to make some noise. We've got to keep making noise. We've got to keep talking about it. Exactly. We've got to keep the movement going. This panel is talking about it. This panel is an example of exactly what I mean. After this panel is over, I urge you guys to keep talking, keep the, the discussion going, write about it, make art about it. People can look at it and read it and get to the issues in people's faces and into their minds so that there's no way that people cannot think about something. We're not letting these issues dis, uh, disappear. Exactly, says Amelia. We have to keep advocating for ourselves and our language. We have to keep that recognition going. We need to keep these records in history. The reason why certain languages are dominant is because the dominant people have been writing about them. I, when I'm reading history books and I don't see discussions of my language or of the Oneida people or of Black people, I know it's because the white people have been writing about them. But I know that, that Oneida people and Black people and so on, other marginalized groups are there just because they haven't been written about, they have been there. I remember one time, uh, when a, I remember when I first met the, an Indigenous person who told me that they do use sign language, that there is Indigenous sign language, I was very taken aback. Why hadn't I heard about that before? Why haven't history books written about that? Why haven't I been educated about that? And, you know, so many immigrants are moving here from the islands. Why aren't their sign languages being recognized? When I go to the islands and I realize, oh, it's because they've been colonized. Every island has been colonized. Their languages have been forced uh, into the secondary or tertiary languages. And I realized that, you know, with, outside of the schools that language hasn't been taught. And so these, need, these records need to be kept of our history. We need to keep advocating because without it, awareness for us as a deaf community and even hearing communities as black people and, and other marginalized people will be eradicated and we will be called, we can decolonize ourselves in that way by keeping the movement going. Do you wanna to add to that, Dominique? You know, often we do switch the languages that we use, but sometimes there's also that conflict depending on the situation. So for example, you know, if you're, using it if I'm using ASL and uh, someone's using English and they use a certain word and then you have to th that use of word influences our thought and then sometimes I think wait a second you know I have to take time to myself to think about what it is exactly that I want to say and express myself with we don't have the same language and sometimes there can be that cultural conflict So it's not necessarily translating it from that to, to my language or vice versa, but it's how we express ourselves. So you have to be careful about the language and the meaning of those certain words or signs. You know, I, I don't wanna be influenced by the English language, but I do wanna understand what it means. You know, and when I think about my language and translating between the languages, you know, I wanted, to, you, to express myself using my own language and think of it in a positive way and understanding. But there's that liberation in that way is by claiming, reclaiming our language and our ways of expressing ourselves. We have a right to express ourselves in our own language. And that is the, the bottom line. That is the exactly, main point. Exactly, exactly. Hand snap for appreciation. Janelle saying, and again, so in uh, using sign language, we create records of our language through videoing ourselves. And that's how we uh, talk about ourselves and, 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 and record our history. Pictures are static, but art is not. Film is not. Right, so for example, you know, most, for in the English system, they rely and they, on the spoken language. They believe that that is something that people must learn. They must learn how to speak and write clearly. 
you know, and our people don't believe in that. We don't have the written form that we depend on. It's an oral tradition. Our languages are passed down from generation to generation through spoken language or uh, passing it on through sign language. It's not written, but we do have a written form, but it's not how it's passed down. And so for me, you know, being able to to accommodate that that style and writing it down is beneficial because you can have a, a record of it and documentation of it and understand the grammatical systems and how the language is used. You know, but the emphasis in my with my people is not so much about having it you know, written and that literacy in the written language, it's, it's the oral tradition and you work with and you communicate with each other and to pass it on and learn and you listen to the language and you apply that to how you express yourselves. Uh, you, you take that learning, you know, and it's not just about writing it down and passing it to somebody else, but it's that lived experience and that general understanding. So that way, it's the same thing with Oneida Sign Language you know, or any sign language for that matter. It's not about writing it down. Like you had said, Janelle, you know, we'd have to videotape ourselves and document it that way. And, you know, to, to understand the concepts and the meaning of the sign language. This is such a hot discussion. Uh, did we want to go on to the next uh, viewer question? Oh, did you have a question, Sarah? Yes. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for sharing. You know, I've been watching all your comments talking about BASL and uh, all the research that has been done in the United States. You know, we think about sign language and how that has influence. And we talked about code switching here and the conflict that it has and how we express ourselves depending on who we're communicating with. So we have BASL and ASL and those different languages, but how do we challenge those ideas? You know, if someone, a white person wants to learn BASL because they're fascinated by the language. And like you had mentioned, like, how does that, how does that make you feel when you feel that the, those that have oppressed and colonized all these years, so you, you wanna share the knowledge, but there is a certain limit, but you know, it is, when you think of it as your own language and then you see the people who are just, you know, it's the trendy thing right now, it's fascinating, you know, how does that make you feel? And how do you right now currently feel about, you know, after being ignored for so many years and not having that recognition, not having that research done on your own language. And now all of a sudden people are starting to view it. And, you know, we have, you know, our deaf space and deaf time and, you know, we watch and we learn, but you also don't want to be further colonized by this fascination by the deaf community. Thank you for your question, Sarah, from, from Courage. Dominique, yes. You know, I know that some people want to learn and, you know, sometimes they want to learn about deaf culture and they're fascinated by that. And people are at different levels, you know, of course, they, they're fascinated by learning sign language, and that's great. But we want to make sure that your reasons for learning that language are appropriate, you know, when I, for learning that sign language, when I think about Indigenous sign language, and Indigenous cultures and language, I know that people don't share the same culture as me. In my culture, we feel you know, there are boundaries that we place and we have to be careful, you know, and you have to be careful to not cross the line. You know, if you do want to learn, uh, you just have to be respectful. Before you learn a language, ask the questions, ask about approach and the, you know, what is appropriate behavior and what's not. Have those open discussions if you are really wanting to learn about language and a culture. Just know, that you have to set those boundaries from the get-go and it should be fine. Amelia, Janelle? Nope, what Dominique said, I agree 100%. We both agree.
And there's a question from, I've missed the name of the person. So when you're thinking about the future and the youth of today, so how do you expose youth to this topic of language and art? And what is your plan uh, for yourself uh, to expose that to deaf youth? Uh, you've talked about art and language and uh, switching languages between communities and who you're talking to, but uh, how do you plan on doing that in the future? Well, says Amelia, I majored in deaf studies and linguistics, and I have worked as an advocate. I teach ASL. Um, and I've learned that so many deaf youth don't have role models for themselves. Statistics show that if someone sees someone who looks like them, their academic skills improve if they're taught by that person. And so we need to, I'm trying to finish my, uh, my work in order to improve that access for youth. So if you have, if you see someone, because representation matters, and if you see someone who represents you, who is educated and so on, who's leading the movement, it helps that exposure lead, just like you, Dominique, within indigenous, indigenous deaf movement. Each, you need to have someone who represents you and who looks like you. Janelle, Dominique. Well, courage, uh, already said, exposure is so important for youth, says Janelle, sorry. Um, I don't know if there's anyone here watching, but um, but this is a good topic of discussion to begin. You know, we once we have the language and we have people who are curious and we have art and we have resources and everything, if that's there, what do we do with that? You have to listen to people, listen to people like ourselves and other individuals. And then you have to urge youth to start thinking. We have a youth here. Dominique is a youth, for example. <laughs> And so, you know, this discussion is already making headway. And also too, Dominique saying, you know, for the youth, I just want to say that, you know, you have to provide access to the arts from the beginning and provide that access to information. And so they're aware of it, you know, feed their curiosity, let them ask the questions. If they have that from the get-go, and they start from the beginning as learners in that, then they will be exposed to it and they will have access to that information through the art and through that expression. And we keep that contact ongoing. Um, anything else? Next question. So we have eight times it, 8.51. Wow. Ah, wow, so Janelle, I've been having fun. So energizing. It's a great conversation. And Amelia, Amanda, sorry. So now that there is more and more information on Indigenous people in residential schools, is there any documentation on Indigenous deaf children going through residential schools from the, there's more research now and findings about the 60s scoop. I was wondering if there are any, any documentation of deaf students from that time and Indigenous sign languages. From my understanding, um, there's no documentation of that, but you know, I have met some folks, uh, for example, my mother who had gone to residential school. So residential school, you know, depends um, where they were established. And so in Ontario, there are three schools for the deaf here. And some of the Indigenous students did transfer to them from the other residential schools. You know, depending on where they lived, sometimes they wanted to keep them closer to home, so that would affect what school they went to.
So before they went to the residential schools, they would have their own home sign languages that they would use with their families. And then they would go to school and maybe learn the other sign language. So Indigenous residential school, uh, they weren't exposed to sign language at the school. And so those who went there, and I think, I don't know when it was, but there's one person that I had met who had shared their story about their family and what happened to their family. And I learned about their history and their experience. And so they eventually forgot that sign language and that language. So those that went to the schools for the deaf, they were able to, you know, they were younger when they went. And of course, they experienced racism going to residential schools because they were uh, the minority being Indigenous children in the deaf schools. So, but there are do, few deaf that I'm aware of that went. But in terms of the documentation or the inclusion of those Indigenous sign language, I don't think it existed at all. You know, and to be honest, you know, the truth and reconciliation that is something that they recognize has been lacking all these years. So, Amelia asking, Dominique, do you have a challenge sometimes asking Indigenous people? to talk about their experience, Indigenous deaf people to talk about their experiences, maybe they're too traumatized uh, to record their experience? Yeah, you know, because going through that experience, the 60 scoop and the residential school, it's not something that people can easily express. You know, some people want to leave it behind in the past and you don't want to pry too much because it can be overwhelming uh, and quite emotional and for many reasons. And there's not just one specific reason, but yeah, it can be quite challenging and, and uh, difficult to do. Right. So we have 854. So we have, I think, one last one, and then we have to wrap up. So just to ask one final question, you know, when you have, think of one final comment you wanted to say to our audience, uh, you know, thinking about BASL, Oneida Sign Language, you know, what is your one gift that you want to leave with everyone? Well, says Janelle, quickly. First of all, thank you to the audience to coming. And secondly, I want to make sure that from this discussion, you get an, more of an open mind um, in terms of when you meet someone and you have a question about maybe what they're signing, be nice when you ask. Don't ask, what's that? You know, don't, don't like look, uh, you know. Don't, don't be don't, judgmental. Don't be judgmental about them. If you want to learn, you have to be respectful in order to take that learning opportunity. And if you're disrespectful or judgmental, you're going to miss out on a lot. Exactly, says Amelia. What Dr. What Janelle said, just keep an open mind. And when you keep an open mind, you learn so much more than what you've already you've already learned. And when you ask someone, oh, what's that sign you're learning? And when you sit back and you observe and you don't criticize in the deaf community and in the hearing community. You will learn so much more and you can learn to ask um, people respectfully. And that's why I started becoming a linguist because when I started learning about languages and linguistic terms, I was able to learn how to explain to hearing people about to deaf people and deaf black ASL and their culture and indigenous sign language and their culture and all the different languages that come with the different cultures. So my exposure to linguistics helped me to learn and help to change other people's attitudes. So you as the audience must change your attitude if you wanna learn, especially about language, including sign language and all languages, period. Dominique? I just wanna clarify, you know, when we have this discussion about language and linguistics, I understand all that, but you know, Linguistics means, you know, for this in Canada, it means, uh, you know, studying, going to school and academic, but I don't necessarily think it means just that. I don't have my doctorate, uh, you know, and I, I'm, I know my language, I'm fluent in my languages. And it's a community, the community that you should rely on and seek 
knowledge from. You know, I, I was taught through my family and my community, and we, it's already there. It's embedded in our, in our community. So we have community education. It is not just an academic thing that we, we think about in, in terms of post-secondary education. And it's important to know that when you talk about language or culture, just don't, you know, my biggest concern with sign language is, you know, maybe they don't know, you meet a person who doesn't know sign language and they, they just think, oh yeah, that's cool, you know. Uh, maybe, it, regardless of whether they know the language or not, and, or you know the language or don't understand, but, Don't just take a language and use it to your own advantage and for your own benefit. You know, be respectful of the, of the space, the deaf space and the communities that it's coming from. So that's just my one word of caution for the, the folks listening tonight. I agree, says Amelia. There's so much cultural appropriation that you see, especially with sign languages. Sometimes people do it without even realizing it. Sometimes people within the deaf community can do it without even realizing it. And when they do, it's so embarrassing. So please just don't, don't do it. And again, some people have the attitude of, oh, I've already, I already know, you know, what's going on. No, keep an open mind. You know, teachers and students both have to keep an open mind. And sometimes we have some ASL teachers out there, you know, don't respect deaf space. Maybe they're not the most appropriate ASL teachers. Well, I think we need to wrap up for this evening. Thank you, Amelia, Janelle, Dominique. Thank you, Ku and Becky as well, and the interpreters, Carmel and Anissa. And also thank you for everyone here who are watching tonight. It's such a, such a great discussion. It was such a hot discussion. You know, I, I think now I'm, I'm not gonna be able to relax for a few days. I'm gonna have so much to think about. So thank you so much. and. Love to everyone. Love thank to you everyone. everyone for coming. Amila saying thank you all for watching as well. Thank you to the audience. Full round of applause. Amazing. Thank you all so much. This was such an enlightening and meaningful final panel for the unscripted series. Courage, thank you for your excellent moderation. Uh, it was such a joy to have you. Amelia, Janelle, and Dominique, thank you so much for being with us and sharing your thoughts and your experience. It was uh, just wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much to everyone. Um, I echo everything that Becky just said. Um, huge thank you as well to our interpreters, Anissa and Carmel. Um, and also another thank you to uh, Red Dress Productions and Theatre Posmerai, as well as Liz, who's been behind the scenes running the whole the whole Zoom um, and Caridwin, uh, as well as Rinchen, um, Angela, who's in the breakout room and so many others. Um, so thank you everyone tonight. Uh, just a, a reminder that the active listening room uh, will be open for another 30 minutes. Uh, there will not be ASL interpretation provided in that room, but if, if anyone um, needs any support, uh, Angela can provide support via chat uh, and a survey's just been posted in, in the chat. So um, if you could take a couple of minutes to fill it out, it'll also be sent out via email to everyone who registered um, via the Eventbrite. So again, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Oh, and because of how the Zoom room is set up, uh, if we end the meeting, um, the breakout room will close. So we just invite people to uh, leave on your own time. Good night, everyone. Oh, Amelia is saying good night. And I just wanna say thank you to the interpreters, Carmel and Anissa. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, Ku, for hosting this. Thank you, Courage, for inviting me to this event. Anytime. This is my first time. I don't like presenting. I'm not a presenter. I felt kind of awkward, I must admit. You did great, Dominique Singh. You did great. Thank you. I don't like having the camera on me, but thank you regardless.
for pushing me to be good to get out of my comfort zone. So thank you all. Janelle's doing a little round of applause. Happy Friday, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.